met you last night. You're from Arizona. Would you state your, your name and where you're from and your question for Dr. Sproul? My name is Christy Olthoff. I'm from Sierra Vista, Arizona. Um, thank you for being here, Dr. Sproul. Um, so my question is, um, in chapter 23 of Deuteronomy, it states that a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of God even to the 10th generation. How then does David come before the Lord at the tabernacle when he is a descendant of Ruth, who is a Mo Moabitess? <laughs> well, I think, uh, well, I think that's easy. Uh, David was... David was David, and he, he, he was able to transcend all of those problems <laughs> being the, related to Ruth. But again, that's a general and generic uh, prohibition. And, uh, and, and, and it's, I also think that it's a statement that is uh, somewhat elliptical. And what an elliptical statement is in Scripture is something that is left out that is to be supplied on the basis of the general understanding of the teaching of the Word of God. And even though it's true that in terms of uh, descendancy, David was from uh, the descendant of a Moabitess, but she was not a practicing Moabitess. She was one who embraced the religion of God. And so I think that that gives her a pass as far as that prohibition, because I think the implied elliptical understanding is that somebody who is a practicing Moabite cannot come into the presence of the Assembly of God. Thank you. I hope that's okay, Chris, Chris, for you. But don't, I hope the rest of the questions aren't as hard as that one. Good afternoon, Dr. Sproul. My name's Jordan Brokaw. I'm a new student minister in Reedley, California, right outside of Fresno. And my question for you today is, as a new student minister who preaches and teaches to middle school and high school students every week, how can I respectfully respond to parents, people in the church, and sometimes even pastors over authority over me, uh, who encourage me to entertain the students, sometimes even dumb down uh, our activities at expense of faithful teaching of God's Word. How can I respond in a respectful way? Well, again, I think with great, with a spirit of humility and patience and long-suffering, recognizing that these people are in authority over you, yet at the same time, we know that we are to respond and obey all who are in situations of authority over us unless they command us to do something God forbids or forbids us from doing something that God commands. And so I think that you have to deal with the, the ethical issues of that. And though you give as much respect and humility as you possibly can, you have to be consistent with the mandate that God gives you uh, in your ministry. Thank you, Dr. Sproul. You're welcome. Good morning, Dr. Sproul. My name is Officer Wyatt Foster. I'm a peace officer. <laughs> my, uh, I'm used to testifying in court and just saying my name like that. Um, <laughs> my question for you this morning is, uh, if Jesus and Paul used harsh words against their opponents in Scripture, does that give us permission as believers today to do the same? That's a good question, officer, and I'll try to answer it to you. I, I'm, unfortunately, I can't answer it for you this morning because I'm in, in Florida and it's afternoon for me. So <laughs> you're going to have to accept my afternoon answer and apply it to your morning uh, inquiry that, that you give. Surely you have evidences of, of uh, Jesus and Paul using language that today we might even regard as being intemperate. That's one of the reasons why down through the ages, uh, Christians weren't uh, all that hesitant to use some very fierce language, as you saw in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th, 16th century, on both sides of the debate. But at the same time, we have uh, 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 provisions and teaching of Scripture that first of all, I'm not Jesus, and I'm not the Apostle Paul, that I don't speak with the absolute authority that they do. And we are to uh, be respect, although God is not a respecter of persons, we have to show respect for everybody that comes into our orbit. And so I think that we should do everything in our power to avoid that kind of inflammatory 
language that we may be tempted to use in the middle of uh, the heat of controversy. But I think, again, uh, we are to, to show a certain charity even to those who are fiercely against us. Thank you. RC, before we go on, we have a rather timid uh, group here because we don't have that many questioners. So I want to encourage <laughs> those of you to come forward. Now, you've heard the old saying that uh, there are no stupid questions. RC doesn't believe I know, that. but I think I'm about to hear one. <laughs> that, RC, that was not the segue I was anticipating. <laughs> but we do have a special questioner here for you. I'm, I'm working hard to think of a stupid question that I could ask. <laughs> no, I, I, listen, I, I, I played golf with you a few years ago, and... Um, you certainly weren't at that point playing the game that you played before and that you loved. And I just want to deal with the truth, and I know you do too. Is it true that you got a hole in one recently? No. I got a hole in three recently, which was even more extraordinary. A hole in three occurs when you're on a par three and you put your first shot in the water and you tee it up a second time and that time you hit it in the hole. So I had a hole in one twice removed. Um, hey, if, if, you're, if you're a pastor, you get a mulligan, so it's a real hole in one. <laughs> Thank you, John. I, I won't forget that. Hello, Dr. Sproul. I have a question about, um, has there been any evidence of the change of opinion since the Manhattan Declaration or a clearer understanding from the evangelical community as a whole from them? Do you, have you seen any change because of your stance in MacArthur? Uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen anything that's uh, all that provocative. I've talked to some of those who were signatories of the Manhattan Declaration. And I'm not going to mention any specific names, but I've had some people in a strong leadership position of the Manhattan Declaration who've told me that uh, they agreed with me now on my uh, uh, problems with it and that they regretted having signed it. But as far as a general response in the general evangelical community, I haven't really seen much of a change. And I, I see that there is this uh, uh, ongoing sense that the Reformation is over and that uh, we share unity in the gospel with, uh, uh, with people of other religions and that sort of thing. And uh, th that's uh, pervasive among the evangelical world today. And, and I think we have to be patient with it. And yet at the same time, we have to, with charity, resist it. Thank you, Dr. Sproul. Yes, sir. Hi. Good morning, Dr. Sproul. I'm, Hi, I'm, you? I'm Carolina. I'm from Portugal. <laughs> Um, so my question is in Genesis 6, 6, says the Lord regretted that he made man on earth. And so my question in this is how can the Lord regret something if he knows everything from the beginning? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that question. It's a very good question, a provocative question. Obviously, if we, if we look at the whole context and teaching of sacred scripture, we know that it's utterly impossible for God to regret anything, including the making of uh, this uh, corrupted and rebellious uh, uh, creature called m mankind. But the Bible speaks in human language on many occasions. As Calvin said, God stutters when he speaks. He stoops to our level and speaks to us as children. And so you'll read that the, the, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And we know that that is uh, uh, language that is uh, symbolic and personification. And we know that God is not literally a cattle rancher who comes down to the OK Corral every now and then to have a shootout with the devil. And so even though the Bible uses human language, or what we call anthropocentric language, to describe God, including such anthropocentricities as stating that he has regrets. God is immutable and omniscient. 
He knows what he's doing from all eternity, and he knew what would happen before it happened, and so there's really no ultimate possibility for regret. Again, that's speaking in anthropo anthropomorphic language, that is, language in human form, because we are anthropoi. We are humans, and that's how God speaks to us in our language. But again, it's that the, that, uh, the Bible in these uh, narrative stations, uh, statements like that will then balance it out later in the didactic statements and say God is not a man, that he should lie or that he should die or that sort of thing. So I think it's just a matter of literary understanding. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deanna. Um, I was part of a long conversation last night with a couple friends with a couple of friends, and uh, we were discussing double predestination. And my question is, what is double predestination? Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about double predestination. There are some communities that believe in what they call single predestination, meaning that God has eternally decreed to save certain people that he's appointed for salvation, and that is the elect. But as for the rest, he simply passes over and still holds out the opportunity for those people to be saved. Now, often uh, double predestination is expressed in what we call uh, a synergistic fashion or a fashion that is called positive, positive decrees. In this respect, double predestination would mean that God positively decrees and determines in advance those whom he will save, namely the elect, and in the same method, he uh, decrees the damnation of the sinner, and that just as on the one hand, he creates positively saving faith in the hearts of the elect, he in an equally determinative fashion creates fresh evil in the hearts of the reprobate to make sure they don't come to belief. Now that is not the Reformed doctrine of double predestination. Reformed theology does teach predestin that double predestined in so far as that not everybody will be saved. And so it's double or nothing, really. You can't have single predestination and, not, and, and just ignore uh, the non-elect. Uh, or unless you're a universalist. But the distinction is this. We had what we call a positive negative decree or an asymmetrical view of election. I have a, an essay on this whole subject in uh, the uh, uh, Festgrift that was written for John Gerstner several years ago where I wrote extensively on the subject of double predestination. But the positive negative says that God positively uh, involves himself in working faith and creating faith in the hearts of the elect while he simply passes over the non-elect without forcing them into unbelief or creating any kind of fresh evil in them. So it's positive in the one hand where he intervenes to create faith, negative in the other hand where he doesn't intervene and, and create fresh evil. I hope that clarifies it a little bit for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Hi, Dr. Sproul. My name is Martina Saia, and I'm from in Mission for Christ Indonesian Church. I've learned your book about Tolib in 94 when some students from Indonesia went to uh, reform um, theological F school in, in uh, Orlando. Orlando, yes. And my question is, is it necessary for church, for pastors to, in a church setting, challenge congregation to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior? Because many churches send missionaries far, far away, as far as Africa, as far as Asia. Uh, but what about congregation in the church setting? Is it fair that they are challenged to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Augustine wrote many years ago that the, uh, the church is a corpus per mixtum, that is a mixed body that includes both <coughs> uh, wheat and the tares. 
and the tares grow along with the wheat, and we can't read the hearts of people. Now, I don't think that it's appropriate to preach every Sunday on evangelism and, and, and talking about uh, trying to call people to salvation every single time, because the purpose of church and the sermon primarily is to, uh, to, prof to develop the uh, growth of people who have already made a profession of faith. It's a, it's a gathering of Christians. Now, again, since I've just said a moment ago that there is a mixed body, you would be naive to assume that everybody who's in your congregation on Sunday morning is a born-again uh, person. And so it is appropriate to call people not just to a profession of faith, but to have a genuine profession of faith. And not only do we have, is it appropriate, but it's necessary. We heard the end of John MacArthur's message on uh, Acts 17 when he talked about that God said the days of, of ignorance are over and that now he now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day by which he will judge the world in righteousness and he's appointed the judge who is the resurrected Christ. And so I think we have to make that aware to our congregations, even though they've made a profession of faith, I warn my people all the time that uh, a profession of faith never saved anybody. It's the possession of faith that you have to have. And remember that, that, that the judgment day is coming and you will be judged by whether or not you have genuine faith or not. I hope that answers it for you. Thank you, excellent. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Spohl. Uh, my name is Jerry. And I just have a quick question for you. I have friends at my college. Uh, they accuse you and Dr. MacArthur as uh, people who understand and teach Trinity as Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. And I just want to know how would you uh, respond to that? Any wisdom for me, how I can respond to that, to my friends? That they, my they accuse us of speaking of Father, Son, and the Holy Bible, or did you mean the Holy Spirit? Holy Bible as, as the teaching and the understanding of Trinity. That the Bible is part of the Trinity? Yeah, so uh, they, they, yeah. Well, I have heard it. Well, they, they are well aware of your stance and Dr. MacArthur's stance on, on the scripture, like how you affirm it. And also they also know your stance on the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, specifically uh, in the understanding of Strange Fire Conference, how you spoke and what... Uh, Dr. MacArthur's stances on that. So I just want to know how I can respond to that uh, to my friends. Yeah. Well, okay. I would say, uh, as far as your friends are concerned, I would say that Dr. MacArthur and I never, for in, in the slightest, ever elevated scripture to deity. It's the word of deity, but it's not deity. And we believe in the full trinity of the Holy Spirit, and we believe the Holy Spirit inspired and superintended the giving of sacred scripture. Now, when we have the, the, the issue of uh, neo-Pentecostal theology, uh, we have differences between classical historic orthodoxy and the movement that started uh, in the 19th century with uh, neo-Pentecostalism and their understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. And there are lots of points of agreement among us, but there are also some significant points of disagreement. And so I would ask you to go back and look at the uh, message or listen to the messages that, that we gave at that, at that event. I wasn't there present live, but I gave a video lecture on uh, understanding the significance of the day of Pentecost and how it was uh, reduplicated in all of the groups that were of, of uh, important interest in the early church. It was given to the Jews. It was given to the uh, God fears. It was given to uh, the Gentiles, you know, and, and you had Pentecost, as it were, occurring at, for the Jews and for the Ephesians and for uh, those at, uh, the god fears at Cornelius' household and so on, so that you see that uh, what, what I think that the book of Acts was teaching and what the apostles themselves saw when they, were, uh, when they had inquiries to interpret the significance of these historic uh, outpourings of the Holy Spirit, they read the significance is that all of God's people were receiving the outpouring and, and empowering for the gospel of, the, of the God, the Holy Spirit. 
And I think that's the principal difference that we, we experience today. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hello, Dr. Sproul, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Great, great. Uh, so my question is pretty specific. Um, is separation and marriage permitted in scripture? And if it is, what would qualify that? You mean divorce? Uh, so just separation between or the, just the separation. marital couple. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, you have the biblical sanction for temporary separation uh, for uh, religious purposes and whether or not you can, can draw from that a basis for the legal concept of legal separation, which uh, uh, many people uh, endorse and accept. But that's uh, a little bit stretching of the point, I think, from the temporary uh, separation from conjugal expression in the New Testament. And of course, the Bible does give, I believe, give gr grounds, just grounds for divorce on the basis of uh, pornea or immorality and on the basis of the separation of the non-believer. And so, I mean, there are those who, it, who will take the view that divorce is never okay according to scripture. I think they neglect the acceptive clause that Matthew gives and, and Jesus teaching on the question. But also there are those who wanna have a very easy path to divorce, no fault divorce and uh, you can divorce it for just about any reason you want. And so we have a crisis with the sanctity of marriage in our culture and in our, our church today where very few people are really trying to uh, understand what, the, what God teaches about marriage. You know, in, in the classical marriage ceremony, you hear this pre that's used by many, many different church denominations. It says that, that, that God has instituted marriage, that Jesus has sanctified it, but that marriage is not only instituted by God, but it's regulated by God's commandment. And so when we look at this question, when the marriage begins to have tension and trouble, we need to understand that God has rules and regulations for how and when and under what circumstances it's legitimate for that marriage to be terminated. Do you mind if I ask you a follow-up question? Uh, just specifics? No. Um, so in churches where they say emotional or physical abuse, would that merit a separation then? Uh, that's a different, two different things. Emotional abuse, I mean, that's so vague and amor amorphous, you don't know what that says. Physical abuse, in, in many churches, understand physical abuse to be a kind of immorality, of a kind of basic uh, adultery because you're violating the marriage vows and violating the sanctity of, uh, of uh, the marriage vows. So, but, the, but I would say that theologians are divided on that question of whether or not physical abuse uh, rises to the level of grounds for divorce. I think in certain circumstances it may. Okay, thank you. But it's very difficult, you know. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Sproul. Um, my question was, uh, given that the Bible uh, clearly commands us to respect and obey uh, uh, government institutions, um, how should we view the American Revolution? Well, the go those who were uh, uh, Christians at the time had strong differing views, particularly between the Anglicans and the Presbyterians. The Anglicans were f saying <clears throat> that uh, there was no Christian justification for revolution. And the Presbyterians were arguing that there was uh, moral justification and biblical justification uh, for uh, the revolution based on the issue of the authority of lesser magistrates. And here was the issue there, that Parliament had illegally imposed uh, a, a tyrannical activity and tax on the colonists in the 18th century. And the uh, Magna Carta gave the authority to the people to protest against unlawful tyrannical acts. And so the lesser magistrates in the colonies those who were giving governmental authority in the colonies. It was viewed by Presbyterians at the time 
that those lesser magistrates of the local uh, magistrates in the colonies had the authority to protest uh, the tyrannical actions of Parliament. Now, if you ask me who was right, ultimately, I'm going to have to wait to heaven to find out the answer to that question. But I, don't, I think that's a very difficult question and not an easy one to grasp. But, uh, you know, I wish that we lived in a time today where the only tax we had was on tea. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Sproul. My name is David Kim. I attend the church here. Uh, my question is, how should we understand the idea of generational curses found in Exodus 20, verses 5 to 6, especially in light of other passages, such as Ezekiel 18, where it says, a son won't suffer punishment for the father's iniquity, and a father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity? Right. Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of people who would see that as a contradiction in Scripture, because we've, we're warned in Exodus, for example, that violations of the covenant uh, will have con consequences to the second or third generations or fourth generations and so on. Where now we find Ezekiel is saying is that, that the, uh, the, uh, the, the Ill children have eaten, uh, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And uh, Ezekiel makes it very clear that God does not hold morally, hold these descendants morally responsible for the sins of the father. So how do we square those? I would say this that in far, as far as God's judgment is concerned, the second or third generation is not going to be held guilty for the sin of the original sinner. However, what I think the point of, of, uh, of the Pentateuch is, is that the sin of the fathers has a consequences long after the father dies to the second, third, and fourth generations. If I live a reprobate life and godless life, there, the chances are that the repercussions of my sin will impact dramatically my children and grandchildren. So that sin has a long-lasting impact, and I think that's the point of uh, the generational uh, uh, consequence issue. Thank you, Dr. Sproul. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Sproul. Uh, How about somebody ask me an easy question? Okay. <laughs> this probably is not easy. Maybe it is. Do you have any concerns about the current spiritual formation movement, in particular how one of their practices is to teach you how to hear God's voice speak to you while you are in prayer? Uh, yeah, I would have grave concerns about that. I mean, these kinds of movements come and go, but they're basically really not new. This is basically an attempt to have God's revelation given to us beyond the scope of Scripture. There's enough information that God has revealed to us in sacred Scripture by which we are to live our lives. The will of God is this, that we are to be holy and that we are to be sanctified. And that is by following where we know God has revealed himself. You start looking for private revelations elsewhere, you're opening the door to the very kind of idolatry that John uh, MacArthur was uh, speaking about earlier. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Sproul. God bless you. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Sproul, or should I say good afternoon, uh, good afternoon to you in Florida. Yes, <laughs> Thank my you. name is Trevor Sheets. It's an honor to be able to speak with you. I apologize in advance for the somewhat difficult question. It is this, by being unable to perfectly obey the greatest and second greatest commandment, are we constantly living in an active state of sin? <clears throat> yes. God bless you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, do you want me to elaborate on that? <laughs> Anytime I disobey a law of God, I'm sinning against God. And even though we are forgiven and we are justified and we've been covered by the righteousness of Christ, the old saying of Luther was, simul justus et peccator, at the same time just and sinner. I have not been glorified. I have not been perfectly sanctified. And so I still have vestigial remnants of sin in my life. And when I sin against those commandments, 
I am violating the law of God and am, am guilty. That's just the broader answer to the simple one. Okay? That Wonderful. was easy. Thank you. Glad I could provide an easy question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Reese, and my question is, why did God create sin and Satan in the first place, knowing we would sin? All right. <clears throat> the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why God created. I don't, uh, we say that God did not create evil, although I know uh, the passage in Isaiah is translated in the old translation by I create evil and I bring prosperity, and that's a, one of the, that's a use of a parallelism. That is, I bring prosperity, I bring catastrophe. That's what that means, not that God creates moral evil. But God certainly did more than simply know that, that uh, our parents were going to fall into sin. Now, if you can bear this, I'll quote Augustine. Augustine says that God ordains freely and immutably whatsoever comes to pass, and then the, the parentheses that Augustine would, would say, in a certain sense. Now, God, if there is sin in this world, and there's a devil in this world, you know absolutely that God ordained that there be a, a devil, and that God ordained that human beings would sin. That's not the same thing as saying that God sinned. You might say, well, God, that was a bad thing that you did for creating the devil, or a bad thing that you did to uh, having creatures that would sin against you. Now, we never can, we're never allowed to call good evil or evil good. Now, here's the difficult thing I want you to say. I want you to understand that evil is evil. It is not good. But it is good that there is evil. There is good, it is good that there is a devil, or there wouldn't be a devil, or there wouldn't be sin, because God has ordained both the existence of Satan and the uh, existence of sin, and everything that God ordains ultimately is good. You can chew on that for a little while. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. School. Uh, my name is Stephen, and I've been uh, part of uh, Grace Community Church for a good part of a decade. And my question is this. In your professional opinion, uh, success and failure, what would that look like in the eyes of Jesus? Uh, <clears throat> obedience or disobedience? That's what it looks like, because we're measured uh, in the final analysis on whether we are obedient or the degree to which we're obedient. And when, God, when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, he's not saying you've been perfect and you've been sinless and all that. We know better. But he also says, looking at us, that just in the parable of the talents, there were some that hid their talents in the ground, some that made five-fold response, ten-fold, and so on. And we are called to be productive, obedient Christians building up treasure in heaven. And I think that, we're, that, the, that we are not given rewards because they are, we merit them. But Augustine says, it's God crowning his own gifts. God gives me the grace to anything of obedience that I do. And then he goes ahead and adds a reward to it, which I don't deserve. I don't have any claim on. But nevertheless, he does hold that out that at the last judgment, there will be various degrees of blessing and punishment. Thank you, Dr. Scroll. You're welcome. Uh, hi, Dr. Sproul. Uh, pleasure. Hi. Um, my father is a longtime Christian. He's been a very strong Christian. He's fallen under the influence um, in the last few years of uh, Christian universalism. Um, and so I've been in a discussion with him, ongoing discussion, but um, in regards to, say, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, do you have any thoughts as to why um, the first Adam, the condemnation is universal, whereas the second Adam, the um, justification is so limited? And doesn't it look in a sense as if uh, Satan numbers-wise, has been pretty successful in his rebellion? 
You know, one of the questions that uh, theologians have faced over the ages is, this, are, is the question, are there many that are going to be saved or, there will f or are there few that are going to be saved? Now, one thing I can tell you that I'm absolutely sure of, that not everybody's going to be saved. And that to be, even though you have parallelisms established with respect to the first Adam and the new Adam, you can't draw from that universalism, I don't think at all, because the scriptures everywhere else makes it very clear that not everybody will be saved. And so I would hope that your father would run for his life from that kind of teaching. And at the same time, the question of whether it's going to be few or whether it's many, I don't know the answer to that on how many. I don't know how much faith God requires on Judgment Day. Some people make it by the skin of their teeth. You know, uh, some have a much fuller, uh, greater expression of saving faith, others less. But we still know that the requirement for salvation is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that those who, who are enemies of Christ are going to perish. And, uh, and then we, we hear about the judgment. I know there's been a whole movement among evangelicals of annihilationism and saying that uh, it's one thing to say universal sal salvation. The other one is to say, well, not everybody's going to be saved, but nobody's going to be damned eternally. I think that's a mistake, too. I think the scriptures make it clear that the judgment is a judgment that is everlasting, and that's why we should be in fear and trembling about the preaching of the gospel. Thanks, sir. R.C., we have uh, time for one more question. Oh, baby, it's going to be an easy one. <laughs> Hi, R.C. Sproul. My name's Christopher Mendeville. Um, I wanted to know, what is your view on the altar call in a church? Should it be a public profession of faith, or should it be a private matter between man and God? Well, I don't think it's all necessarily an either-or question there. I, uh, I don't practice, I generally practice altar calls in my preaching. Uh, I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with giving altar calls. However, I think that altar calls are exceedingly dangerous for reasons that I've already mentioned. And that is that we are filled, our churches are filled with people who have made professions of faith who do not profess faith because they think, well, all I have to do is go forward in an evangelistic call, raise my hand, sign a prayer, card. Those are all forms of professing faith. And I also don't think that we can ever need to manipulate God's work of salvation in the hearts of sinners. We pray, we preach as accurately as we can and pray that the Holy Spirit will take that word that is proclaimed and God has promised that it won't return unto us void. And it is the power of God unto salvation, which is the gospel. And so, I don't feel like I need to manipulate that and, and add to it. And so my concern is to be as accurate and as uh, powerful as I can be in proclaiming the Word of God and calling people to respond. But I don't call them to, to respond by marching down an aisle because, of the, again, I see it everywhere that people think that they are saved simply because they made a profession. And making a profession never, well, now we all who are saved should make professions. Don't misunderstand me. But just making the profession doesn't mean you have the possession. And so that's where I would say it's a question here, not of, of ultimate right or wrong. An ethical question is so much a prudential question. What is the wisest way to proclaim the gospel?